uh, I'll start out with one of my favorite slides. Uh, this is uh, some, some recent data on our attention span. Uh, so in 2000, it was 12 seconds. Uh, 2013, it was eight seconds. Uh, I have four daughters. I think this is somewhat aspirational in my personal opinion. Uh, but I think that it puts a fine point on just how important it is to create compelling, engaging content that really catches your audience from, uh, from the get-go. Um, so a little bit about uh, Visually. Uh, I was the CEO of Visually. We acquired in January 2016. We have a, an online platform that helps you create great content. So we've got a network of about 1,400 freelancers uh, of every possible creative discipline. We've got an online project management platform that helps you sort of go through the content creation process. And uh, we've recently wrapped in some content strategy and planning services as well based on uh, what we're seeing. I'll touch on that a little bit um, in a minute. We were acquired by Scribble Live, which is a content marketing software. So uh, the goal here was to marry up services and software. Uh, they've got some different uh, features uh, and products around helping with content planning, helping with content strategy, insights of what you should be talking about, what your market's talking about, uh, and then how do you actually distribute that and get that content out in front of the right audience at the right time through the right channel. Uh, so there's, there's two tenets I want to talk about before I kind of dive into the regular agenda. Number one is just the effectiveness of visual content. Um, there's a reason there's no visual on this slide. Uh, so take a good look at this, and right before you slip into a coma, I will go to the next slide. Right, so there is a lot more data on this slide, right? And it's great data, and it's really interesting, it's really valuable. No, you know, eight seconds, that's all I got. So this, you know, being able to visually represent data and really capture the essence and the importance of, of the message you're trying to get across very quickly and succinctly, succinctly is much more important than just vomiting bullets on people and hoping they retain something. The second major tenet is really about storytelling. Uh, there have been countless studies on the effectiveness of storytelling as a way to drive retention and uh, engagement. Uh, one of the more interesting studies I was reading, um, as someone tells a story, parts of their brain light up. And if you're doing a good job of it and people are listening, uh, the, your audience's brain lights up in the same places. So you know, the fact that there's that tight of a connection and that tight of engagement as you tell stories, this is the combination of you know, taking great data, coming up with compelling visuals, but they're really understanding what's the narrative and what's the story you're trying to tell behind the data. So with that, uh, I'll cover the agenda real quick. I want to start with just definitions. Um, content marketing is one of those things where if you ask five people, you get six opinions. Uh, and then I'm a big fan of tips and tricks. So I want to talk about a couple tangible things that we've learned over the years. Uh, I'll then invite Angela Bostic up from uh, Goizetta Business School, talk about how they've put some of this into practice. And then if, uh, hopefully if we have time, we'll do some Q&A. Uh, so with that, I'll dive into the definitions. Um, content marketing, you know, the formal definition is about creating and distributing relevant and valuable content to attract, acquire, and engage a clearly defined and understood customer audience. So fairly dry. Uh, I think the more uh, engaging pieces, or engaging version is the elevator pitch. Traditional marketing advertising is telling, your, telling the world you're a rock star. Content marketing is showing them that you're one. Um, and I think this is the difference that a lot of, um, as people get into content marketing, you're not supposed to be talking about yourself. This is not about features and benefits. You're not selling. It's being in the right place at the right time with the right information so that the audience you care about is getting value from the content that you're creating. And it may or may not ever result in a conversion, a sale, a sign up, an attendee. Uh, but if you're in the right place at the right time over a long enough period of time, that cumulative effect will ultimately drive what you're looking for. Uh, for practitioners day to day, it's about getting the right content in the places where your audience is seeking it. So keep Key components here are really knowing who your audience is and knowing where they go to consume content. Uh, for those of uh, you will run into pessimists, uh, particularly those who tend to control the budget, uh, and it's about you know, creating content that's going to cut through the noise. Um, you know, the traditional bullhorn of media and advertising just isn't as, as effective as it used to be. You know, the, who here has content block blockers on their 
uh, on their browsers. You know, just the amount of volume of stuff coming at us, we block it out automatically, if not technologically. Uh, so you really have to cut through all that. Um, I think the other important thing to note is this is not new. Um, the furrow was sort of a, one of the earliest examples of content marketing. Um, they didn't write about how great their steel plows were. Uh, John Deere was writing about topics that were of interest to farmers, and he helped them solve their problems, and he built a relationship. And then when it came time to build a new plow, that's where they went. So, and Jell-O, I still, I think it's really funny that you can write an entire recipe book about Jell-O uh, and do it multiple times. I don't know how many ways there are to eat Jell-O, but they found them all. Um, and then, uh, you know, Lego has had a phenomenal run. I mean, Brick Kicks has been around for quite a while, and they really focused on their power users. You know, it wasn't the, uh, it wasn't my kids who play with them for about 10 minutes and then leave them so I step on them in the dark. Uh, these are the people who, this is what they do, this is what they care about. Uh, and then more recently with the Lego movie, um, you know, again, it, yes, it was tangentially related to Legos, but it just entertained a lot of people who happen to care about their product. Uh, so, so we'll get into the tips and tricks a little bit. So number one, using every part of the buffalo. Um, in content marketing, the scarcest resource is a great data set and a great narrative. And once you find those two things, you don't want to waste it all on one really good piece of content. So yes, you want to create at least one really good piece of content, um, but one and done is what we see a lot of, and we think it's just a, a waste of ultimately the hardest thing to find, and that's that data and story. Um, so we really encourage derivative content. So maybe you'll have a, a core piece, but once you have this great data set and this great storyline, you can chop it up into lots of different formats for lots of different channels and lots of different audiences, and ultimately get a lot more leverage out of that story. The number one complaint we hear from customers is, I just can't keep up on with the constant demand for content. I never have enough resources, I never have enough writers, I never have enough designers. There's just no way to do it. And by leveraging that one storyline into multiple different uh, components, you can, you can ultimately get a lot more out of it. Uh, and so we talk about the tentpole content versus the derivative content. Tentpole is the, that's the meat, that's the steak. Uh, that's the long form content. It tends to be, take you longer to produce. It takes more of a commitment from the audience. If they're gonna sit and watch a couple minute video or they're gonna read a white paper, they have to be, they're in at that point. Right? They're engaged, they want to learn what you're, what you're offering up. Problem is getting them there. Like how do you actually draw them through the funnel to get them to sit still long enough beyond the eight seconds to read your white paper or to, to watch your online webinar. And so that's where derivative content comes in. You can take that same storyline, that same data set, and chop it up into bite-sized snackable pieces. You can use social, you can use mobile, you can use lots of different channels to gradually draw them into your longer term, or longer form content and, and sort of get that buy-in as you go uh, so that they'll actually give you their time. Um, it's also really important to understand where you're gonna engage your customers and your prospects and your, your, uh, your audience. Um, mobile, obviously everybody's coming through mobile and social these days. Um, so white papers are great, long form videos are great, webinars are great, they're not gonna do it on their phone on the train. So you have to have a social and mobile strategy, you have to have content that again, leverages that story and data set but can be consumed uh, via mobile and, uh, and social. So I want to use uh, an example. We've done some work for Cisco. This was a white paper that we designed for them. Um, this is not what I would call mobile or social friendly. Uh, it, this is ultimately where they wanted their users to go. Um, it is very dense. Uh, it's a spec sheet. Um, this is not going to attract people in by the droves. It's not going to generate buzz. It's not going to, um, this is for the, the person who is clearly engaged and, and bought in. Um, we did a series of vines, which unfortunately I can't show you, but when you get, this, when you get, the, uh, when you get the PowerPoint or uh, the slides, you can click on these links um, about CBR8 versus CBR6. So CBR8 was the new router that they had rolled out. It was faster than CBR6, better than CBR6. And so we created a series of vines that showed, you know, the one on the left was two remote control cars racing. One's a Porsche, one's a Volkswagen. Porsche dusts the Volkswagen. CBR8's faster. Click on the link, learn more. 
Um, the house on the right, uh, it, you'd flip the switch, you'd hear a buzz of electricity, the house would flip around and have a quick snippet on CBR8. This is not what you typically see from a B2B tech company. But they used social, they used mobile, it was quick, it was engaging, it drove a ton of traffic back to the longer form content. They had set the hook and earned the right to get that user to, to read more about their product. Uh, another example is a, um, a program we did ourselves. So we did a survey of uh, designers, creatives, and marketers. And we, a lot of the data was around just the communications breakdown of you know, why marketers and creatives don't always work well together. Um, we took that data set, we took the storyline, and we chopped it up into lots of different content through lots of different channels. So we had infographics, we had micro content, we had videos, we did a webinar, um, we did a longer form research guide. So that was, that was the tent pole piece, but we scattered all of this micro content and shorter form content throughout the web to drive everybody back to the webinar and to the, uh, to the research report. And so it was a great success for us. Um, so moving on to tip number two, and that's knowing your audience. And I know that is marketing 101, I am shocked by the number of companies we walk into and we say, tell me who your personas are. They say, oh, well, you know, it's students. It's like, eh, not really what we're looking for. That's not enough to target your content. Um, so you know, really, and I, and I think the other main thing that's missing is documenting them. So yeah, everybody has a general idea of who their personas are and who they're pursuing. It's, uh, I would say less than half of the companies we talked to have actually sat down and documented, written it all out, gotten really specific about uh, who they are, what their problems are, what value you can bring to them, because that's ultimately gonna inform your content strategy. You want that intersection of where you have uh, brand equity and you know, people are gonna trust you. If Visually is writing about uh, trends in uh, online education, we don't have a brand voice there. We have no credibility. Um, so we've got to stick to our knitting and we need to find the overlaps of what we're talking about and what our, what our customers care about. Um, this is a great example of how we did it wrong. Uh, I love talking about it because it happened before I arrived. Um, we did a video uh, around mass incarceration and by any normal measure, it was a runaway success. 1.5 million views, 5,000 comments on social, ton of traffic to the website it did not address anything that our core market cares about. We sell to content marketers, social media marketers, demand gen and PR and communications. That's who we sell to, those are our personas. Now they may happen to be interested in mass incarceration, uh, but it's not somewhere where we have brand equity, it's not somewhere where we can really come in and be the expert on mass incarceration. Um, so while, you know, if we were USA Today, amen, that was great, uh, we're not. So. This was a ton of time, a ton of effort, and it was a false positive in my opinion. Um, how to get it right was we did a whole series on using every part of the buffalo. So getting really tactical about, around how to take one piece of content and, and drag it out into a much broader impact. Uh, it was specifically targeted to our customer base. We knew exactly what problems they have. We gave them specific information of how to go fix that, um, and while we did not get 1.5 million views. Uh, we ultimately think that was a success. Um, and so as you start to think about what you're gonna talk about and why and, and you know, who you're targeting, um, understanding what your market cares about, what you are talking about, and what your competitors are talking about is really important. And this Venn diagram is actually an output of uh, one component of Scribble Live software. And, but just as a visual, you know, there are there is green space where your customers are talking about it and you're not talking about it and your competitors aren't talking about it. And so that's the wide open area. Uh, there's a surprising amount of space where you and your competitors are talking about it and your customers aren't, they don't care. You're wasting your breath. Uh, and then there's areas where your competitors are owning the space and you're just not even playing. So I think thinking about your content topics and how you're gonna target those personas with the right content it's a, just a, a good visual to, uh, to get you thinking in the right direction. So tip number three is about planning. Um, I think the evolution of content marketing over the last couple of years, you know, three, four years ago, if you went to content marketing world, it was a pretty thin crowd and everybody's trying to figure out exactly what it was. Um, a year or two ago, it was all about volume. It's like, oh my God, I gotta get more content out. 
Uh, now I think everybody, the pendulum's starting to swing back and people are worried about, you know, is it working, is it effective? Um, and the effectiveness of content marketing is so much driven by your strategy and your plan that we were spending a lot of time, we actually launched a content strategy service because so many of our clients were just, you know, machine gunning any content they could find. Uh, and it just wasn't, there wasn't a cohesive theme around it. So I'll give you a kind of a, a quick version of, of how we think about content strategy and planning. So number one is the personas. So we talked about that. You don't need to go nuts with it. You can, I mean, we've seen companies that have 15 personas, extremely detailed. I think the best rule of thumb is two or three, uh, particularly if you're starting out. You can get fancier later, but start with what you think your two or three prime personas and really go and really understand them. Um, that becomes the reference point. You should be able to tie all of your content back to you know what problem of which persona are you solving. Um, setting goals in advance. Uh, so this is a tricky one because the challenge with content marketing is it's not it's not like a landing page where there's a clear call to action and you can measure it based on who, how many people click the button and did they continue on through the funnel to sign up, register, etc. Content marketing tends to be cumulative. So. Conversion is often a second order effect. Now, Angela is gonna walk through um, what they've done and, and they have actually been able to tie it all the way through to clear success metrics, which that's the end goal, but you've gotta know what the, what the initial, um, or I guess the, the leading indicators are to conversion. So is it engagement? Is it, uh, do they continue on to read more content? There's a lot of different ways to measure this. I think probably the biggest problem in contrib content marketing right now is attribution. Like how do I attribute a single piece of content's impact on the overall buyer journey? There's companies trying to solve it, but I don't know that anybody's really nailed it yet. Um, step number three is understanding what the buyer journey is. And again, this is very different for a CPG co company versus a, uh, a business school. Um, but there are some generic frameworks. This is one that, that we've used, awareness, consideration, conversion, loyalty, and advocacy. And uh, in, in this context, I think of advocacy as standing shirtless at the football game with, your, with the uh, uh, logo or the, uh, the mascot painted on your chest. Um, but yeah, I think this framework fits most buyer journeys, but you know, as you sort of get into the process, you can start to, uh, to map that to, to what you know about your, your audience. Um, the other question is what content do you want to present when? So early funnel content when they're really just getting to know you is all about informing and orienting them. And again, this applies no matter what kind of company you are. So really helping them understand the landscape, you know, who else is out there, what the options are. You know, this is kind of the, the buying guide is a typical uh, inform and orient. Uh, as you get deeper in the funnel, now you're, you're really trying to you know, convince uh, so that's where the white papers and the case studies and the product demos, and it starts to look more like advertising and less like content marketing. Um, and then retaining and growing, you know, that's, I think there's a huge opportunity to take your existing students, alumni, uh, and give them uh, insider content that only they can access. Make them feel special, add value, you know, and we, we have, um, we've done programs that will invite just our customers to come in and attend a session. And you know, it's only for them, it's content purely for them, it, nobody else can come in. And it's just, it's a great way to drive that retention and loyalty. Because uh, you know, particularly in a, um, uh, in a B2B or uh, in, a, in a B2B scenario, it, it adds a ton of value and uh, keeps them coming back for more. Um, step four is aligning the channels and the content with the journey. Uh, so again, this is sort of another general framework you can think about, but if you take each persona and you map the standard customer journey across the top, and then you think about the different channels, uh, what content do you want where? So what topics are you gonna talk about? What formats are right? You know, you're not gonna use a long form video on Snapchat, right? So you've gotta start to map out what's the ideal type of content, the ide ideal topics and the um, ideal format for, for each of these boxes. And then you start to pull it all together into a calendar. And so what this is again, sort of a typical uh, simplified version that we see where every quarter you're gonna have some topics and themes based on each persona. Um, and then based on what that topic is, what the themes are, 
uh, then you start to figure out all right, what's the ideal channel, what's the ideal format for that specific type of content and that specific type of, uh, or that specific persona. And that ultimately what is what drives your, your day to day content marketing uh, production and strategy. So, with that, I'll uh, invite Angela up to go a bit deeper and walk you through some of the uh, specific programs that she's run. With the hand off. Hi, me again. Hi. I, I think there's just some really great insight from what, uh, what Matt shared on what Visually has been able to do. We are a partner of theirs. They've been um, helping us with that content journey. So I'm going to keep my conversation a little bit more focused on the tips he shared and not necessarily down into the tactics. Because where we found the most value in understanding visual content marketing was taking the dearth of content we had and actually figuring out what part was content marketing worthy. Right? and what really belonged on a cutting room floor. So a little bit of info, um, who are we, and more importantly, why you should care. So Emory University's Gazueta Business School is located in the beautiful city of Atlanta. If you have not visited us, now is a good time. Don't come during the summer months. Um, it is a wonderful environment. I talk a lot about the high achieving millennials, and that's because our school is small by design. We are the smallest of the top 20 business schools. About 180 full-time students, 60 in a one-year program, 90 in an evening program, very, very small, very intimate environment. Perfect for students who come in and desire to experience a program, be held accountable, make sure they're, they're sort of having a back and forth conversation with their faculty, um, able to fail, but able to be supported while they're there. We have an intimate learning community that produces fantastic results. You should care about this because the environment that we're talking about is one that is very difficult to tell in words. Right? It's the kind of story that you really need to, to feel. And everyone says that. Every school says you need to come and visit my school to know what it's like. Um, it really is true. We, we really know that when you visit Gazueta Business School, very few people walk away without being changed. So our communication strategy, uh, challenge I should say, is that we have small budgets. I know everybody in here has small budgets. We really small budgets. And a very small team. There are only five of us to execute across what is in essence 10 programs five flavors of an MBA, we have a BBA undergraduate program, tops in the country, PhD program, a suite of executive education, master's programs. There is more than enough content to be discussed here. And our responsibility is figuring out how we take those programs and layer on the expertise we have in analytics, in social enterprise, in finance, and all of these things. And instead of blowing things out bigger, how do we narrow the story down better? Right? And do this so that the prospects who can't experience us in person can feel like they can experience us in theory. Right? And so that's the challenge that we deal with. Um, so our question at hand is, how do we authentically and compellingly communicate what makes us great? And you'll hear me say authentically and compellingly often. You can be authentic and boring. You can be compelling and not real. And so being able to be authentic and compelling together is critically important and is part of the ethos of who we are at Emory. So we learned how to do things that gives us content that shows, not content that tells. Right? So how many people in here who work at business schools or universities at all create view books and um, faculty pieces and research, all kind of details, right? That content tells a lot, but it often doesn't show very much. And so we had all this amazing content and needed to talk about how we move that to a strategy that would resonate with the people who couldn't necessarily walk our halls right away and feel that. So content, in general, can do lots of things. Content can inform you about things. Content can persuade you. Content can engage you. So what do I mean by that? If you are going to color your hair, ladies, I need my roots done. Don't talk about me. If you're going to color your hair, the instructions on the, back of the book, on the back of the bottle inform you what to do, right? You can read a blog article about this new type of color, and it will persuade you to try it. And if you are daring, you can get a YouTube video and it will engage you on how to color your own hair, right? Not all of those pieces of content are important to do all of those things. But collectively, you can actually have a hopefully decent hair coloring experience. That's the way you should look at the content that you have. Not all content has to do all three things, but know the right content to do the right things. No matter what, content should always make you want more. Right? You should finish it and decide that you want to hear more about, read more about, engage more with. For everyone who works in higher ed, you understand that this is not always easy. So in my prior life, before I worked in, in education, I worked in the NFL. 
And I can promise you, creating content for Sunday night headlines or Monday morning quarterbacking is way easy to be authentic and compelling in comparison to having to explain how to make an ideal application or how to, um, how to uh, start and fill out and be a part of our class. So the content you start with is what you're going to have to start with, but you can find ways to make people want to digest it more. So there are two ways I think of content. The first is content can be an informant. Content can be the person or the entity that goes out and walks you through these steps. So good content should make things understandable for you. You should be able to read it and say, okay, now I get it. Better content makes it digestible. Matt was explaining that two plus two instead of four, right? It breaks it down into parts that you, you want to be able to consume more of. The best content is truly personal. And that's when you don't just keep your personas on the back end for you to think about, and you know the type of student profiles, but you actually put those personas out there so prospective students see themselves in the work that you're doing. So what do I mean by that? We have an evening MBA program, um, amazing, number one in the Southeast, very proud of our part-time MBA program, uh, mirrors our full-time program a lot. A lot of electives, on-campus recruiting, tons of uh, faculty opportunities to engage, clubs, activities, uh, everything that looks like a, like uh, like a one-year or two-year MBA program, but it's very different. And so we tell students a lot of info that is very attractive and compelling, but we need to make sure they understand how those programs differ with each other. So we have 25 plus FAQs we put on our website and we update them regularly because of all the questions we get about how the program works. There are more than 80 unique program pages just for the evening MBA. And it attracts a lot of different personas. The number one question we get, students say, yep, I read the site, I went through everything, it looks great, what's it gonna be like for me? What is my evening MBA experience going to be like? And so rather than trying to get them to digest 80 pages, read FAQs and figure it out, we started to walk them through that. So the personas that Matt was talking about are profoundly important to drive how we do marketing but really effective when you give them to the outside world and let people see themselves. So one of our audiences, when we started to personalize our career acceler accelerators, literally people climbing the ladder. We have tons and tons of things that are great for career accelerators, but one of the things we did was distill it down to a sentence. Really? So if you're a career accelerator and you're looking at our evening program, you are looking to build a toolkit to be effective in today's business world and make an impact with your organization. That's it. I don't need 80 pages, I need a sentence. And then I also need some iconography that takes those different areas about my program and distills it down into digestible two plus twos. So you see here some of the elements career accelerators really like about our program. Yes, they're on our website. Yes, they're in our viewbook. Yes, they're called out as, uh, as largely as we possibly can. But only when we put them in this manner and frame them together did people start to understand what my experience as a career accelerator would look like. Did the same thing for career switchers. They didn't quite like being seen as fish. But we did this for career switchers and talked about setting your career in a new direction and then highlighted some of the other parts of the program different from career accelerators that were important to them. And we did this also for our career balancer. One of the personas we see a lot of are individuals who start off wanting a degree in one direction. I want to get in and I want to finish this part-time MBA in two years as quickly as possible. And then life happens. You get married, you get a promotion, you have a baby, and now you need to slow this program down and balance things out. There was no real easy way to explain to somebody what it would be like for them, but when we explain that a career balancer, someone who's looking to balance their career and their degree, could be done in these ways, it really started to break through with them. And this is just distilling 80 pages to icons and sentences. And I know it sounds really very basic, but it is uh, has done a wonders for us being able to communicate in a much more uh, succinct way. So is personal content better? You guys can see for yourself. Uh, when we launched these, these are the top most viewed pages. We had five times growth on these pages in three months. Uh, it's the number one downloaded content for us, right? So we made it small enough that you might want to download it, not necessarily big enough you could just scroll through so we could see whether you were engaging with it. Um, it's very referenced in our interviews and our applications which lets us know people are digesting it. And then most importantly, we get dramatically reduced questions, right? People don't say, what's it gonna be like for me? They say, 
when I take the program and I participate as an accelerator and I do this, how does that work? And that lets us know that they're more informed, they're more bought in. So content can be a fantastic informer for you, and likely you have everything you already need to inform people. You just have to figure out how to package it in the way that makes it most digestible for your audiences. Content can also be an engager. Content can be the part of your school that people want to engage with, and everybody wants this. Every school wants to be dynamic enough that people want to engage with them. And you know the information you want your prospects to hear, right? The question is, do they want to hear it? And more importantly, are they going to listen to you when you say it? Right? You know, in the, the time in your career when you're sitting down, you have this great idea, you present it to leadership, and they sort of brush you away. You bring consultants in a month later, they come back and say the same thing to leadership, it's a genius idea, right? That's, that's what content as an engager can do for you. Let the content tell the story so that you're not telling it and so that it feels more authentic and compelling. In this manner, we, I talk a lot about being a bow tie and not a bullhorn, right? Being a bow tie means you bring your audiences and your communication together in a central place, and in this case, let people digest it both visually and then share it organically. So what does that mean? What does that look like? You have your prospects. These are prospective faculty, staff, students, anyone that lives in this world that wants to know about you. Then you have your community with all the content on this world. And instead of trying to speak to each one or trying to tell them what you want, you bring them together in a universal place where you put curated content. And a valuable curated content home really just needs two things. Um, in this case, we use our curated home through social. So our two biggest needs were a brief hashtag strategy and a visual place for our content to live. So the first part of that is the hashtag strategy. We had to build a memorable tag strategy. I do not mean make memorable tags. You will stay up all day trying to think of really cool things to make your tags into. Literally, make them memorable. Hashtags do not work if nobody remembers them or remembers how to use them. So make them something easy, something identifiable. Uh, we have the challenge that our namesake's name is often difficult to spell, but it was important for us to include that in there so that people knew when and, and where to use it. We have three hashtags. Gazueta Knows, which we use for our faculty content and all knowledge creation. Meet Gazueta, which we use for anything related to student engagement and student stories. And Gazueta Kudos, which we use to celebrate the accomplishments of any and everyone in our community. We teach these three uh, hashtags at orientation. We talk about them consistently. We put them out in all of our communications and we funnel it. So there is heterogeneity across those topics and homogeneity of our topics within those categories. We then took all the content we had and figured out what lived in which bucket, which kind of things were Gazueta Kudos and which things were Gazueta News. And then we took those really large scale pieces. I call them thud books, you know, the ones you print that has everything in the world in it and you drop it on a desk and it says thud. We took all those large scale books, all those pieces and parsed that content into digestible pieces of content living in one of those three hashtag strategies and disseminated that content in a shareable format. We've done that through lots of things, but I'd say one that's the most visual and probably um, the most uh, unique in our case is we did that recently with our faculty piece. So every summer when we hire a new faculty, we create for the academy a piece that highlights and gives bios of our new faculty. So this is one of our new accounting faculty. When we started that, we still made the thud book, and it was a banner year for hiring, so we had a lot more faculty than we usually do. But then we took each one of those bios and parsed them out one a day and introduced them to the larger community. This shareable content went from being, here are 20 bios of people on 20 topics that may not relate to you, to a small snippet about each one of them. It's shareable, it's digestible, it's much more visually appealing, and it finds a way to connect with your audience. We then put it in what we call our Gazueta Social Index, or our Pretty Home. So this is just a tool that we've used. A company we partner with is called Tint. There are lots of providers there. It is a social aggregator. So your hashtag strategy then pulls in through a moderator on my end. Um, any of the hashtags underneath the three that we use, all of the content related to this. So at any time, if you visit our website and go to our social site, this is what you'll see. This is the curated home where our prospects and our current community go to learn about and to disseminate more information. And it's been phenomenal. 
because it makes it a little bit easier for members of our student body to share information with us that we can then share out, as opposed to every student club wanting to have their own, hashtag, their own uh, handle, right? Or the faculty can have a very easy way to distribute things because there's a place to go and find snippets and share it out broadly. So this was, uh, was one of the places where creating the pretty home and the easy hashtags brought everybody around. You heard me talk earlier about wanting to get alumni to be advocates and students to be evangelists. You have to give them a house for which they can you know, hang things themselves, but also then disseminate information outward. So is shareable content really shared? This was the highest engagement for faculty content. We only launched it about a week and a half, two weeks ago. It has done phenomenal for us, um, not the least of which our faculty have easy ways to talk about themselves to each other and to others. Um, we started by tagging schools where the faculty went and graduated from to increase our eyeballs, right? So I've got a faculty, let's say, graduates from Stanford. It's not a competitive thing. I can tag Stanford and get a whole different set of eyeballs attached to what it is that I'm doing and make that content more shareable. Um, it's also easy for the media to pick up and see your scale. I'm sure most of you who have social media channels realize that parts of the media follow certain things. They know our three hashtags and they know the one place to go to hear what's going on and they can get it in a digestible, easy way, which has become more and more the norm for how they like to communicate. And frankly, the visual way lets prospects learn about something that in honesty, they did not care about much before. Faculty weren't something that our prospective students were coming in and asking about regularly to explain who the new faculty were. And in this case, they can see not only who they are, but how they relate to the things they're coming to study. So I, I would say in, in summation, if content is gonna be your informer, there's a strategy you can use to make sure you're doing the good, better, best of understanding, being understanding, making sure that you're going to be somewhere on the far end, something personalized, but in the middle, digestible. And if you're going to have your content be a little bit more engaging, figure out an easy house to put that in so that you're not burdened as, the, as your marketing head to be the only one trying to engage people. So with that, I, got, I think we have eight minutes left, Matt, to take any questions, if there are questions from the group. Do we need this? Yeah. Any questions? I would love to hear a little bit more about the governance around <laughs> your hashtag strategy and, and, and how you're orienting them at orientation mm -hmm. and things like that and how that's carried with each new round of eager beavers that mm -hmm. enrolls the next year and wants their next channel. So the hardest part is what you just mentioned, the, the fact that this class is gonna roll over every year. But we are part of orientation, and we actually introduce the hashtags as if it's gospel. And the new crop that comes in every year doesn't know any better, quite frankly. And so they will easily adopt what those things are. What typically happens over time is that there are some groups who want to have their own voice, their own mouthpiece. They wanna communicate differently. And so they either want to have their own handle on certain channels or create their own hashtags. Um, and you will not be able to stomp those out. It is a waste of time for you to try to. But you can also feel confident that if you create a home where 99% of content comes in, the 1% of content that's gonna choose to defect will go off, they'll have 15 followers, they'll tweet their entire event all day long, and they'll go dormant, right? And so in reality, you don't have to show them that they're wrong. You can tell them that they're wrong in a manner by letting them see how the aggregation of content visually in a manner that is compelling is far more effective than each one of us trying to tell the story or have the bullhorn. Um, governance was tough. We had to sell this at the highest level kind of first and foremost. The great thing about it was the faculty at, at our higher level didn't particularly care at first. They didn't really see how that related to them in any way. Um, until we showed them that one of the hashtags was distinctly related just to them and their research. So I would highly recommend you have one just for your faculty's research. Um, they may not use it as much, but when they want to hear and see things that are going on, they know where to look. It aggregates all of it together, it makes it more robust, it makes it feel more substantial, and your media can be directed to a single hashtag to see where your excellence lays. So that making sure you have something that highlights your faculty in a positive way is, is really important. We have a very small faculty because we're a very small school. I need them all together. I can't have them in, in their mini fiefdoms. Otherwise, we just don't have enough content. Have, 
So you said you have a team of five in your office. Mm -hmm. Do are there other people in the uh, programs who are doing marketing as well as their admissions duties? And how do you coordinate that? Um, so there are not. Uh, a number of years ago, we used to have a marketing person that lived in our executive programs and lived in our full-time programs. We were all, they were all doing the exact same thing, but in their own silos. So we bought all of it together centrally. We haven't grown well enough to sort of kind of fit all the things that we've taken on, but we have a formal relationship between admissions and, and the marketing side. So all the resources live centrally and all the people. So the, it doesn't help you to take the person out of the group and leave the resources there because then they don't have to come to you to do their marketing. So you need the resources and the people consolidated. That's a big fight. Um, it's part of the reason why I don't actually have a lot more staff is because all of that being centralized, you've got to show the value and the need for having, for having a lot more of it. Um, but we work regularly with our admissions teams. We created each and every persona for each program, um, as Matt had mentioned, collectively. Uh, and as they see changes in the profile of their students, we sit down and we redo those personas. As they set their goals, they tell me numbers, and then we walk backwards and say, how many of this persona and how many of this persona? That lets me set my media buying. I need to buy these people here. I need to find these folks here. But it's driven by what their priorities are. Hi, how are you? Hi. Um, so you are just one of the schools within Emory University. So was this a strategy that was kind of from the top down for all of the schools, or are you the only school within the university operating with you know, this, um, this strategy? Um, at the moment, we're the only one operating with the strategy. And I think it's because we're much smaller than an entire university, right? The idea of having three memorable hashtags is pretty easy when you're a single unit. I don't know if you'd be able to distill it down as much if you were a university, um, but it doesn't mean you have to just have three. It just means that you have to have a reasonable, memorable number of them. And there's probably some number in between three and 100 that makes a lot more sense. At the moment, there are not enough people to moderate at the other units for this to be a university-wide strategy. So there's someone at Central, there's someone in some of the other units, but you do have to have a moderator because pretty soon your students will figure out if they want to complain and get themselves a lot of attention, they just complain and add your hashtag. So someone does have to be there to, to figure out what to pull in. It's not a cumbersome process. It's a pretty easy approval process to kind of pull that content through, but you do need somebody who's, who's responsible for it. Hi, uh, how important is international in your inbound strategy or content strategy, and how do you account for uh, language or cultural barriers um, in-house in your team? Do you have staff? Do you have an agency partner? You know, how do you account for that? Me, Matt, both? Uh, Me. For you, yes. Oh, so, um, so that is one area where the visual part has been really important, and I, I want Matt to talk a little bit more about it. We haven't fully moved ourselves there yet. Atlanta is an extremely international city. Uh, and growing so. We have a top 20 business school program, almost 40% of international students, so international is prominent in our strategy. Figuring out what pieces of content need to resonate with each audience and then how to show those things visually so we don't have to make everything translated is, is really kind of a next phase and next step for us because I think that's where content can do real heavy lifting. Yeah, and it gets, I mean, internationalization of content is, gets hard. Uh, because you think about your personas, now you apply an international overlay. Well, it's not international, it's UK or it's outside of London. You know, it gets, uh, it adds a ton of complexity. So I think, you know, as you think about where, you know, we're going to put the most wood behind the arrow. Uh, if international is a really big component, it's going to take, uh, I'd say, an exponential number of resources. Now, you can get away with, there's sort of the internationalization light which might be different languages or some you know, targeted geographies. Um, but that's to go, you know, sort of a full international strategy is quite an undertaking. Um, and the, um, you know, content, visual content is not cheap um, as much as she would like it to be. Uh, yes. But it's, it's time intensive. And so I think you've got to really pick and choose where you're going to use visual content, particularly video. Yeah. Um, and, it, you know, depending on how important international is, there may just be not be enough resources or budget for it. Um, you mentioned uh, that you've set 
centralized your teams. Mm -hmm. um, do you also centralize your your social channels, or do you have? Sorry, do you have, do you have various social channels for all of your programs? No, so we we do have we've centralized it. There is a, a parent channel on all of the channels. We've we uh, participate in most, there's a new one every day, so I'm sure there's one I'm not on yet that I should find out and get on. Um, but the school is on most of the major channels with a, with a single unit. There are, again, other handles from other parts of the school that have communication. And where it makes sense, that's fine. So for example, we have a modular executive MBA program, really does have a high target, very different focus than, say, what you might hear on Twitter in a, in a, uh, a BBA program, right? very distinctly different. Hmm. Whenever they want something to be heard by the larger uh, megaphone, they use a hashtag and we can determine whether it makes sense to pull it in. Otherwise, they can talk about things directly. Um, conversely, for our undergrad program, they'll post things like food in the break room, right? And that's important for 19-year-olds who are really hungry. But it probably doesn't need to make it onto your social feed. So figuring out when we collaborate our content, and when we let the content be diffuse is, is fine. All of our major events, everybody knows that no matter what they put out, whatever handle, we'll dwarf them in volume just because the hashtags allow us to take that content from everybody and sort of bring it in a bit more, more distinctly. Yeah, and the, and the curation criteria, I mean, that's something we didn't really go deep in, but curation is such an important part because you can't, again, you just can't keep up with the demand for content and being able to curate really good content, and having set rules around what you're going to curate and why, coming back to that content strategy and plan. I mean, I think otherwise, if it's a, uh, you know, I'm going to let it in today, I'm mm -hmm. not going to let it in tomorrow, that creates more of a headache. Yeah. So really thinking about that in advance and understanding what those rules and guidelines for what you're going to pull in and what you're going to leave out, that's really important to do up front. And Matt had mentioned sometimes keeping content um, separate, if you will, right? We don't necessarily do that, but we do have times where there's really good content that went out that didn't use a hashtag that we've seen that we don't bring in, mm. right? Or content that uses the wrong ones that we don't bring in because we're trying to create a behavior and a, and a sort of a focus on getting folks to understand how to aggregate their things together. Conversely, sometimes I see really great content being made by some students and I'll message them and ask them like, can you go back and add this so I can pull it in? So it's sort of a little bit of a training and retraining in some cases. They graduate after a period of time, so you train a new crop, but you, you do have to stay consistent so that people understand what it does or does not take for their content to be included. Mm -hmm. I think. One more? Yeah. Um, could you please comment on your alumni-related content, uh, whether you procure it, and if you do, what kind of strategies do you use? Yeah, so alumni content is probably the place where we're going to look to put most of the attention in the, years, in the year to come. Because we're a small school, I only have about 1,000 active students at any one time. I've got almost 20,000 alumni from the business school and then 130 or 40,000 from the university. I need to empower and arm them with this more, but I don't have an orientation to teach them a hashtag, right? So I've got to figure out how do I communicate to them the ways in which they're going to create content that we can pull in. So that's a strategy we're building right now mm -hmm. to figure out how to share it and to create something of value that they get when they do it, right? You want it to be a little bit you know, Pavlovian, that they understand that doing this behavior rewards them with something. So we're working on that. I, I think yep, that's our I think time. We're over. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>